Well, good morning. You know, uh, one of my prayers is, and I know I speak for Nick and Mark as well, we, our prayer is that you enjoy the Word of God spoken as much as we enjoy preparing that Word of God to be spoken, truly. And, you know, the best part about preaching from this is that you don't have to think about things like, hmm, are they going to receive this, or is this too much, is this not enough? It's God's Word. It's eternal, it's perfect, it's timely, it's living, it's active. Yeah. It's all of those things, and it's for all of us. We need to hear it, and then we need to live it. So that's the key. Okay, um, we're going to continue James, this whole James thing. Um, the title uh, for today is, Can't We Just All Be Friends? Um, and we'll see what James has in mind about that. You know, the deeper we get into James, the more we, he uncovers the facade of false worshipers. James has a way of peeling back religion and exposing the true heart of God. He writes about standards in the body of Christ, not rules or regulations as much as norms and postures and attitudes and mindsets that we possess if our claim is that we love Jesus. James is written as an in-your-face letter to the church that I believe is intended for its readers to use to assess exactly where they are in their spiritual lives with Christ. Now keep in mind, this is the earliest New Testament writing. It, it serves uh, as a means to teach these young believers how to process their faith in Christ. And it was also used as a commentary for these young pastors, and they were young pastors, uh, to be able to lead their flocks. For us as 21st century believers, we know there's only one, one thing that can ever teach us the truth of God, and there's only one thing that we can ever use to assist us in assessing our spiritual lives, and that is the Word of God. That's it. We are to 2 Timothy. Paul writes, preach the word. That's not just for the three of us. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Now, let's put that together with what the writer of Hebrews said. The word of God is living and active. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. God's word is a remedy for everything that has gone astray in this world because it corrects what's wrong, it rebukes what's evil, it encourages what's right, and it judges our hearts so we can see just where changes need to be made in our lives. When we're familiar with God's word, it's, it means that we're familiar with how it can potentially change our behavior, which is something that James tells us is a trait of all born-again believers. Last Sunday's sermon from James centered on three wars that he says believers can easily become engaged in. And they are war with one another in the body of Christ, then war with ourselves, then war with God. And we are at war with one another when we gossip, when we speak evil of a brother or sister in Christ, and when we judge other Christians. We're at war with ourselves, a war that is rooted in the heart when such things as coveting and envy and pride and shame and remorse begin to manifest themselves. Now, at the core of these sins, and really at the core of every sin, actually, is selfishness. Selfishness causes us to put ourselves number one, to think of ourselves first, to do for ourselves first. When we're selfish, we will constantly look for ways that we can live our lives happier, albeit a temporary happiness. Selfishness takes very little effort and virtually no discipline on our part. It just naturally happens in the flesh. But as the people of God, we're called to live unnaturally. Look at Philippians. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility... Consider others better or more important than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. 
What Paul wrote there won't ever or can't ever happen naturally. Because you see, embedded within every person is the longing to see our needs met first or way before anyone else. To take care of others before ourselves will only and can only happen by the supernatural power of God living inside of us. And even then, we got to make a way for, for him to be seen. Remember, James is writing to born-again believers, those who already possess the power to live above the natural course of this world. Just possessing the power of God doesn't mean we're going to think of others more important than we think of ourselves. No. It just means the ability to do so is available. Okay, James has made the point that when believers are at war with each other, and when we're at war with ourselves, it is due every time to this third war going on in our life, and that is war with God. What if I were to say to you, can you tell me why you hate God so much? Really? And why do you wage war against him? Now, I'm assuming your reaction would be pretty emotional, and you'd probably take offense to that question. What are you talking about? Hate God. Why would you say that? I love God. I would never do anything against God, ever. I admit, I don't follow him maybe 100% of the time, but to say I hate him, that is way out of bounds. Well, to see just how way out of bounds that question is, we have to first understand what it is to hate God and to be at war with him. Now, you understand we can't go by man's definition of hate or war. I mean, if something has to do with God, we're not going to be able to use the understanding of man to define it because God's ways are not our ways. We have to look and discover what God says hate is and what God defines war with him as being. So let's look. James writes, 4-4. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Now, when I read that, you know, my first thought was, no way can James be addressing the church. Born again Christians, believers, hatred and war against God? Well, go back to chapter 1, verse 1, and you can see exactly to whom James is writing. He is writing to believers. He is writing to you and to me. So then, what is James' goal in writing this? Well, many believe that James is warning those who call themselves Christians that they may be, in fact, living their lives in adultery to God. Sounds pretty harsh, really, to us, doesn't it? Consider this for a moment. Is it possible that James is writing with a much stronger conviction of the seriousness of sin than most of us are willing to hold? So here's a personal question. How egregious do you consider sin to be before God? Just how offensive is it? Is it your belief that some sin can be less offensive and more offensive, depending upon what it is. For your sake, I certainly hope not. Because it is important for you to realize that Jesus took that humiliation, that torture, and that crucifixion every bit as much for gossip than he did for murder. Now, you know that, right? Those straps against his back didn't hurt more or dig deeper for blasphemy than they did for jealousy. Whenever we discuss sin in the church with no regard to level or severity, when we teach that every and in, in all sin that we engage in causes the same exact result with God, there are people who walk away skeptical. Seeing no difference between sins before God is difficult for some to process. And the reason is because we spent our whole lives categorizing sin. And when we do that, when we grade sins, it means we haven't learned to see sin through the eyes of God. We see it mainly as something that's offensive to other people. And to other people, sin has levels. Listen, James writes this letter with such moral outrage over sin 
all sin, that he's informing those in the church who do sin that they are committing adultery with God. James is enlightening those in the church, if they are friends with the enemy of God, then that automatically makes them God's enemy. Now notice, James doesn't describe for us what constitutes that friendship with the world. So if we can define what it means to hold friendship with the world, then we can determine whether or not we're living as an enemy to God. But before we do, I want to remind you of something Jesus said. Matthew 12, 30, he said, whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. Not with me is against me. So what does Matthew 12, 30 say to you? Well, it says to me that we have two choices, right? We can go with Jesus or we can go against Jesus. You see, Jesus leaves no room for a possible third and neutral choice. Now, if we choose to go with Jesus, there's two things that he demands from those in his body. One, unity, right? A oneness of mind, heart, spirit, Mark talked about already. And two, obedience. Unity and obedience. Obedience, whoever has my commands and obeys them, he, Jesus said, is the one who loves me. There's only one way to be united with Christ, to be his ally, and that is to be born of his spirit. And only those born of his Holy Spirit can truly obey him. Now the question is, are we obeying him? In order to obey someone, you must first understand what it is you're expected to obey, right? What is acceptable and unacceptable? James tells us here that friendship with the world is not only unacceptable, but it's also causing us to be an adulterer of God. <laughs> well, then, what does friendship with the world look like? That's the key here, right? Define that, and then we'll know where we stand. In simple language, what is friendship with the world? I know it would make it a whole lot easier if I would just tell you, right? A, B, C, this is, this is all friendship with the world. This is fraternizing with the enemy of God, which is really spiritual adultery. But I'm sorry, I cannot. I'm not the moral judge. You see, in God's court, there's one judge, and you can identify him rather easily. He'll be the one without any sin. I was disqualified from being sinless 67 years ago. And unfortunately, I couldn't find any listing in the Bible of behaviors and lifestyles that define for us worldly friendship. I guess maybe we could start making a list of our own. Huh? Okay, Let, let's try that. Let's start with R-rated movies. Does watching an R-rated movie qualify as friendship with the world? How about embracing profanity-laced music? Is that worldly friendship? Laughing at or telling dirty jokes. How about missing church and sleeping in or mowing the lawn on Sunday instead of coming here? Is playing the lottery or going to casinos? Is that friendship with the world? Now, we're not going to take any votes because truthfully, it doesn't matter what your opinion is. It doesn't really matter what my opinion is either. So if there are any lists, and the Bible doesn't spell it out by stating what friendship with the world is, does that then mean we're off the hook? Right? There's, there lies the attitude James was addressing. Because if you're looking to be off the hook, that might by itself qualify as being friends with the world. Here's how I want to look at this. If we are the bride of Christ, if we are the faithful disciples of our Lord, the last thing we should be wanting to do is looking for loopholes in our relationship that would give us the freedom to live like we want. Quite the contrary. 
If we are the bride of Christ, the only thing we should be looking for are ways to love Him and serve Him more faithfully. If you're hoping that a certain way you've chosen to live your life isn't spelled out definitively in Scripture as sin, and you take that as an endorsement that maybe it's okay in God's eyes, you're looking at this whole relationship with Jesus the wrong way. Instead of asking God, how can I be more devoted to you and obey you more faithfully, you're wanting to know, how many things can I get away with before it becomes offensive before God? See, that mindset in itself is spiritual adultery. And that's what James was referring to when he addressed the church the way he did. Look, if you're in love, I mean really, truly in love, you're so committed and so passionate about your relationship that you're constantly looking for ways to make it stronger, deeper, and more intimate. You're not concerned with anything that even suggests infidelity. You're committed. Infidelity does not even enter your mind. Fact is, we should be so in love with the Lord that the only thing on our minds is to be more in love with the Lord. The mere idea that we have to take an inventory of our behavior to see whether or not what we're doing and how we're living could qualify as spiritual adultery against God, that suggests that it is. Now let's see if I can help you in determining whether or not you're engaged in spiritual adultery with God. How much time are you spending away from him? Jesus said, if you're not with me, that means one thing. You're against me. So how much of your day is spent with him? Let's make an analogy using another relationship. If you're spending the majority of your non-working hours away from your own spouse, then I'm suggesting there is some level of adultery going on. See, adultery does not have to be sexual in nature to be adultery. See, we have to be constantly involved in our relationship with God to ensure we're not developing some kind of relationship with his enemies. You've heard it said before, when this relationship, the vertical, is going strong and is working, then all these relationships, the horizontal ones with others and with ourselves are healthy and they're working as well. Are you living life angrily, shamefully? Are you avoiding certain people in your life, experiencing a lot of regret? Is your confidence shaking? Do you find yourself fearful and anxious a lot? Are you unrested? If so, chances are you're on some level experiencing a war in your relationship with the Lord. James tells us, by ending our war with God will also allow us to bring to an end the battles that we have going on out here and in here. Everything in our lives come back, comes back to a relationship with God, doesn't it? Every single thing. Always does. People who have no relationship with the Lord will forever be at war. War with themselves and war with others. James, or Isaiah 9, 6 tells us that Jesus is the Prince of Peace, which means he is the one who reestablishes for us the covenant relationship that Adam had with the Father before the fall. Without Christ, there's no chance for anyone to restore that peace with their heavenly Father. Jesus' own words in 14, 6 of John, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's Christ who brings us to the Father. And through his blood, we are made righteous. And then the enmity that once existed between us and God is eliminated, and peace can now rule our lives. How often have you said something or did something to someone that ended up with you being angry with yourself? Can't believe I said that to her. 
Or why would I do something like that to him? I'm such an idiot. Then you heap this shame and you heap this guilt upon yourself. Has that ever happened? That was rhetorical. I knew it happened, so you didn't have to. But see, you're not alone. Paul experienced the exact same thing. Look what he wrote in Romans. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. What an idiot. What a wretched man I am. The truth is that you probably said what you said or you did what you did because there is something that needs dealt with between you and your father. Now, you can apologize and try to make it right with whomever it was that you hurt, and you should, and you could attempt to forgive yourself for doing what you did, and you need to, but if that's something that exists between you and God is not addressed, if this is not healthy, then none of this will be healthy as well. Because these horizontal wars are going to happen again and again and again. See, Paul said he needed delivered from all these wars, right? He asked this question, who will rescue me? And then he went on to answer his own question, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, what we learned from Paul is he recognized where the problem was. And he recognized how it was going to be fixed. You see, we got to quit trying on our own to fix the wars we have going on on the outside and on the inside because ultimately both of them or all of them have to do with the war we have going on with God. And the only one who can fix that war, Paul said, is God the Father through his son, Jesus Christ. Now let's say, purely hypothetical, mind you, Let's say I get angry at Michelle. Now, I know that sounds far-fetched. It's even difficult for me to hear myself say that. My daughter's laughing over here. Okay, if I would ever get angry with her, chances are I would end up being angry with myself because that's how it always works with me. Read. You're just so stupid. Why do you act like that? Well, you can bet it's not a wife problem at all, right? It's a God problem. There is something keeping me from the intimacy I need with my father that is keeping me from the intimacy that I need with my wife. Hmm. See, do you find it to be true? When things are going spiritually great with God, and all these other things seem to be going so well, too. Yeah. But when there's something that we haven't dealt with with God, we end up having to make excuses for all these wars going on that we're involved in. Excuses abound so easily. Even as believers, we're very good at justifying almost any behavior, aren't we? The reason I got mad and cursed is because of the way I was being treated. I know I gave him my word, but anyone in my position would have done the exact same thing. The only reason I went and said those things about her, I was trying to defend myself. Listen, my spirit-filled brothers and sisters, those aren't people problems. Mm -mm. People are not the problem. Those are God problems. All of them stem from something in our spiritual relationship with the Lord that is inhibiting us from behaving as the holy, righteous people God has made us. James is saying, make things right with the Lord and everything else will supernaturally fall in line. Our battle isn't against flesh and blood. And we know that, right? But how often do we find ourselves taking it there? So what's the answer? I mean, if it's war with God causing all these other wars in our life, how can we end the hostility that we're experiencing with him? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because amazingly, James has some solutions for all of us. 
But as with everything else we're called to do as righteous believers living in this unrighteous world, it's going to take effort on our part. If you haven't learned already, you will. Everything that we do as obedient followers of Jesus will be met with resistance. And we learned last week that resistance will come from the world, will come from ourselves, and will come from the devil. Now, don't get lost. Don't let this get lost in all of this. Christ has already overcome the power all enemies once held over us. But remember, these enemies are relentless. And because we are imperfect beings, there are times we find ourselves getting worn down and yielding to the temptations of the enemy. I'd like to say that otherwise, but that's the truth. Now, before James reveals these solutions to us, he interestingly prefaces these with a single proverb of Solomon. And it provides a clue to us how we can reestablish any and all peace that we once shared with God. It's right here. James writes from Solomon, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. James gives us in the next four verses ten commands that will assist us in establishing and reestablishing peace with God. Each one of these is so stated in the Greek text that it calls for us to take immediate action. See if you can find all ten. Here's the verses. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Now, time certainly doesn't allow me to cover all ten of these in depth, so I'm going to wrap this up this morning covering the first one because it really is the key to all the rest of them. I believe the very first command James gives in verse 7 will move us away from any and all friendships we're experiencing with the world and move us intimately closer with God. James writes, Submit yourselves to God. Submit. You know, this is actually, submit here, written the way it is, is actually a military term, meaning get into your proper rank. See, a private does not stand in the place of a general, nor do privates go and do whatever they wish. The general gives the orders, and the private obeys and carries them out. Submitting yourself to God also means to surrender. Not to the enemy, obviously, but to Almighty God. In order to fully obey God, it will mean we must first fully surrender ourselves to Him. And understand that this act of surrendering, submitting, is unconditional. In the military, obeying your commanding officer just half the time will get you court-martialed. See, God is not interested in leading our lives three, four days a week. Exodus 25, he's letting us know who he is. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. God is our creator, holds the exclusive right to possess us and claim our love and allegiance. See, God won't share you with anybody else, including yourself. Holding back any area of our lives from the control of God will mean insubordination and we'll find ourselves in battle after battle. One of the greatest lies of the enemy of God to try to convince us is this. As long as I'm obeying God in most areas of my life, I'm okay. No, that's a lie. Unconditional is how God loves us, and unconditional is how God expects us to submit to him. Listen, if we haven't surrendered every area of our life to God then the enemy is ready, willing, and so able to use it as a port of entry. Paul knew that, because that's why he wrote this. Do not give the devil a foothold. Foothold in the Greek is tapas, and it means opportunity. It means power. Do not give the devil an opportunity. Do not give the devil any more power 
than he already has. See, remember that the power that we're given through the Holy Spirit is greater than that of any enemy of God. But even with God's power, look how hard it is to still win all of these battles. So why would we ever give the enemy of God a foothold? Why would we give him more opportunity? Why would we give him more power? But see, that's what we do. That's what we do every time we go out and shake hands with any part of the world. Following Christ means unfollowing the world. Jesus told us, come out from them and be separate, my people. Can't we all just be friends? The answer to that is a resounding no. By submitting freely to God, by spending more time and effort on our relationship with Him, we'll be able to ignore the friendly calls of the world, and they are friendly. They're all dressed up. They all look good. They're all shrouded. The darkness is shrouded from us. And these calls of the enemy will draw us away from God. We've got to ignore them. When wars seem to be breaking out in areas of our life, God calls us to do one thing, not fight them. Uh -uh. No, submit ourselves to him. And here's why. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. And we're in battles, we're in wars, that it seems as though that army that's fighting against us is so vast, is so overwhelming. And it is for us. Here's the key. For the battle is not yours, but God's. See, it works this way. When we submit to him, he takes care of us. When we don't, he says, you're on your own then. Because God gives us what we want, if we want it. I don't want to fight these battles. I don't want wars going on here and here. If you don't either, then let's work on this. Let's submit. Let's give it over to him. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we thank you that it is a simple gospel. That all we need to do is make it right with you and you make it right with us. <laughs> Doesn't mean everything's going to be fun and happy. But we are going to be eternally blessed. So we thank you for your word. We thank you for how it penetrates. We thank you for the potential it holds to change us. You tell us that when your word goes out, it doesn't come back without accomplishing that which you sent it forth to do. We ask, Lord, accomplish that in the hearts of your people. It's in Christ's name we pray. And everyone says, amen, amen. amen. Would you stand with me as we close today?